evening's peers. Okay, he doesn't, he didn't introduce me. I will let you do the fantastic introduction. But uh, I'm Bruce Lee, not the famous one. <laughs> Okay. I am from South Korea, so I guess you guys uh, had very many chance to hear from a guy from South Korea. Well, I came to New Zealand as an investor migrant because I thought New Zealand is uh, very good in terms of ESG. So, uh, and I used to work for an industry called managing other people's money. <laughs> uh, I used to manage uh, Alliance Global Investors Korea for 15 years. And I happened to be the original member of Korea Exchange Corp. Council until end of last year. Well, don't misunderstand me. I had only a couple of sips of wine. I'm not a big drinker. Where is the lady? Let <laughs> <laughs> me drink. <laughs> right there. But uh, I came to New Zealand and tried to look for opportunities for me to contribute for New Zealand capital market. And thanks to Lloyd and then I was able to join a uh, New Zealand Stewardship Court Committee, uh, 12 members. We are working together for over the past 12 months, and we are in the middle of finalizing details of Stewardship Court at the moment. And we have a very ambitious target that we will complete and announce Stewardship Court by the end of September. This year, which is really, really, really ambitious target. I mean, because in Korea, when I started Korea Stewards Code, it took us almost three years. So today, I will talk about Stewards Code. However, it will be my personal view mostly, because we are still in debating among inside our committee members, and there are some inside information that I cannot disclose. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's right. I had a tough time reading the first set of first uh, uh, vocabulary. How how te aroa stretch code in the making? Well. I think some of you might have heard Stewardship Code already, but there are 22 jurisdictions already adopted it, which account for 85, more than 85% of global market cap. Only two markets, big market, which didn't adopt it yet, actually three big markets, which didn't adopt it yet is China, Russia, and New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I'm investing via Colin. So I invest uh, my migration money uh, using Colin vehicle. So Connor is my fiduciary. So originally fiduciary duty is called duty of care and duty of loyalty, right? So my fiduciary is supposed to care about me. Do you care? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you all know, fiduciary duty is not a static concept. It's, it's a rather evolving concept along with capital market theory and development in all the financial market in the world. 
So I, I remember one thing when I started in the US, the biggest evolution of modern fiduciary duty is minimum diversification required. Because the industry managing other people's money is like 225 years old. And until 1950s, nobody knows how to quantify risk return profile of equity. So by the time people were evaluating stocks only using dividend discount model. But Mark, Harry Markowitz and William Sharp, they developed CAPM and industry were able to manage portfolio risk and expected return as a number. So since then, global fiduciary duty concept accommodate minimum diversification requirement as a core concept of fiduciary duty. I think Stewardship Code could be the second biggest evolution of modern fiduciary duty because it requires asset managers like Covenant to do more proactive engagement and proxy voting for their client. So fiduciary duty is, is on the verge of new big change, I think. And it is, I mean, if you think of it, like only until 2008, most of the biggest global index fund are saying in public that not engaging, not boring is our philosophy, investment philosophy. So nobody did it. However, if you look around these days, Vanguard, BlackRock, all of them are doing engagement and proxy voting. In fact, Vanguard has the biggest engagement specialist team in Asia Pacific. So I think this stewardship code movement could change the industry called managing other people's money forever. So what is stewardship code? I, please forgive me my pronunciation. James tried to help me out how to properly pronounce, but I cannot change within 10 seconds, but uh, <laughs> search code requiring corner to be transparent about their investment process and engage with their investee companies properly and doing proxy voting for their beneficiaries. That's the easiest way of understanding stewardship code. And you guys all know about corporate governance code, right? In New Zealand, it became statutory since 2003, I believe. And 2017, Angel X revised it, first time, to reflect modern changes. I think corporate governance code and stewardship code is like a mirror. So listed companies in NGLX stick into corporate governance code. And asset managers like on the street, they need to stick into stewardship code so that they watch each other like a mirror and monitor what they are doing. I mean, asset managers are supposed to monitor and becoming a watchdog whether the BOD or time management of listed companies are doing their job, right? So, George <coughs> Cole, oh sorry, I need to drink. <laughs> Water. <Yeah. laughs> 
So the stretch code generally takes the form of best practice of principles uh, which describe their belief, how they're going to do uh, stretch code for their clients, for their beneficiary. So like uh, establishing and disclosing their policy and how to manage uh, cases of conflict of interest and monitoring and engaging with investing companies, how they gonna vote and disclose it. And more recently, ESG integration. This is a big development because original research code that UK announced in 2010 didn't have it. ESG integration. But 2020 version of stretch code is heavily integrating ESG factors <coughs> into the uh, nature of stretch code, in fact. So, <coughs> oh yeah, I'm drunk. <laughs> This is the chart uh, that I just uh, tried to show you how Stewart Code and Corporate Governance Codes are working harmoniously to improve uh, long-term sustainability of a capital market. Well, for <coughs> other managers, Stewart Code, for listed firms, Corporate Governance Code. So, oh yeah, uh, left hand side is governance risk, ESG risk, and I use a uh, long term sustainability indicator as the simplest ROE, long term ROE, like 10 years. Anyone have idea about New Zealand listed companies 10 year average ROE? I tried to find it <laughs> for like four hours, and I sent him an email <laughs> to find it out. He couldn't find it. Oh, no, Any listen? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> my guesstimate, uh, I mean, based on my readings about New Zealand Stock Exchange, is about 10 to 11 percent. 10 years, New Zealand listed firms average ROE, which is a bit higher than Korean and Japan. <coughs> Japan's uh, listed companies, surprisingly. And corporate governance risk and ESG risk, anyone have any idea about New Zealand listed firms? Hey, SMP. <laughs> <laughs> I could measure that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guess? No? Um, you know, I'd have it, I'd be safe and you bring it towards the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you. Because it's a, such a small market and not many complicated companies, not many big market cap companies, and a lot less conflict of interest compared to that of Korean or that of J Japanese or that of Indian market. So it should be somewhere here. So if New Zealand is located here, I personally believe that the main objective of New Zealand's strategic code should be focused on not improving corporate governance practices, but improving their capital efficiency. So they need to be moving towards this way. Right? If it is only 10 to 11 percent, they need to improve it. So that 
even if New Zealand capital market is small, it could be the most efficient market in the world, productivity wise. Mm -hmm. So I'm Korean. I'm, I'm, I'm a Korean guy, but uh, Korea has one of the worst uh, corporate governments in the history of human capital market. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are few families who control more than like 60% of market cap, and it's growing recently. And they, what they do is they, not only they do greenwashing, but also they do diluting governance issue using environmental and social issues, which is a big problem. I haven't seen such kind of company in New Zealand, except <laughs> <laughs> except Kofrov, but I cannot. I, I'm not going to name it. But uh, <laughs> well, certainly this is not me. Okay, you guys all recognize this is not me. <laughs> Meaning that I don't have any crystal ball. So maybe I'm wrong. But based on my 30 years of experience, I could maybe tell you my opinion. New Zealand's church court could be a stone in a teacup, me. If asset managers like Cornell doesn't actively participate, if Connor doesn't sign it, it, it could be a stone in I guess, right? Or it could be a game changer. Well, I met Barry a few minutes ago, mindful money. is also aiming for the same thing. So it could, if, you, if we pay more attention to just code and its implementation, it could be a game changer, depending upon what we do. Uh, extent of ESG integration, this is a big topic now. Ever since UK upgraded their storage code with heavy integration of ESG, Japan also did it. In Korea, we had a big discussion like one year, but we postponed our revision of Korean Church Code. In New Zealand, the way I feel is that people are more interested in climate, environmental, these things. Uh, well, last week, BlackRock CEO mentioning too much investment in climate could hurt their beneficiaries' interest. So I think there is a debate going on about the extent of the integration of ESG and the nature of ESG. Improved risk return profile, this should be implemented the way, as I described in previous chart, Stretch code need to improve risk return profile of New Zealand capital market. We need to design it like that. Engagement and proxy voting, well, many people think it's a simple to do engagement and proxy voting under stretch code. But as was criticized by UK Kingman Review in 2018, not many UK asset managers were able to do proper engagement and proxy voting. It takes time. It will take time. ETF, like Cornell, will, must have different engagement process and proxy voting process from asset managers like Craig or JV Ware. They must have different and they need to pro pro oh, this is 
difficult word for me to pronounce. Propriorities. <laughs> Which company engage first? It's not an easy question. So they need to do it based on their investment philosophy. And it's going to take time. In Korea, it took, it's been already six years since Korea adopted it, but nothing uh, meaningful change has made so far, because it takes time. Well, I can help <laughs> this area. This is my area. How to build a proper engagement process and proxy that voting process. I think <coughs> really for Korean companies. So I can do it for New Zealand companies. Well, cross-border investment will be affected. Like Kiwi Savers, Superfund, if they want to invest in Australian market, they need to sign up Australian stretch code. If they want to invest in Korea, they have to do it, Korean stretch code. Well, I don't know, but so far, among those 22 stretch code in the world, I think India one is the strongest one. It was my surprise. And second strongest one is South Africa. Third one would be UK, and fourth one would be Japan. And all of these uh, stretch code were sponsored by regulatory agencies. So in case of New Zealand, FMA. If FMA sponsor it, storage code could be more dynamic. Countries like Korea, Singapore, US, industry body, like association, uh, sponsor storage code. And in, that, in those cases, many people are saying storage code is a uh, Storm in a teacup. Nobody pay attention to it. So we are trying to get FMA support for New Zealand storage code. And I think this will be very high end storage code among existing ones. Thank you for hearing from a drunken Bruce <laughs> Reed. some of them directly to our speakers at the end, or equally we'll pick some of the panel, so do keep firing through, because we'll come back to them and we've got time again. Uh, I'd like to now hand over to Michael. Uh, Michael is Head of Asia Pacific for ESG Solutions at the Sustainable One S&P Global. Uh, we've already had the privilege of hearing Michael speak this morning, so he's warned and ready for everything that you've got, so again, do submit your questions. Thank you very much, Dean. I'm just going to, um, to set myself a timer here, otherwise I could talk about ESG for hours and, and um, that would interrupt your drinks later on. Talking about drinks, can I have one of those glasses of wine that Bruce had? <laughs> I need that for every presentation. Thank you very much, Bruce, for that introduction. A fantastic segue into the section that I'm going to talk about. And more so than I imagined uh, because of the focus on ESG integration. Mm. One of the important things about ESG integration is being able to systematically assess the companies in your portfolio. And to do that, you need data. You need data, reporting, analytics tools. And that's what S&P Global has within its market, um, market intelligence and stewardship codes. I've titled this The Benefits of Greater Sustainability because that's the mission, right? bringing data, indices, ESG and credit ratings to help you make more informed investment decisions. I do have a lot on global trends. I, uh, I gave this presentation to many different audiences and I'm wondering here, if I, if I get a sense from you, how many of you are convinced based on what you know from global trends that sustainability is a theme that's here to stay regardless of short-term market cycles? 
in commodities, like we're seeing now. How many, how many of you in this room? Okay. I, I see a, a very uh, sustainability educated audience, so I'm probably <laughs> going to go through that section quite quickly and just pull out some of the themes and then focus on the differentiated ESG data sets and bring it back to some of the use cases that um, Bruce Fenton highlighted around stewardship code and engagement, but other use cases as well for that data. Uh, I, in, in introducing S&P Global, I, I hope you're all aware that S&P Global has been around for a long time, 100 years uh, of experience in, in innovation. Uh, to give you a perspective of why data is important, it's important to understand the benefits and concerns of corporations, because it's the corporations that we're assessing. We're assessing 15,000 corporates, listed corporates in our uh, standard analysis, but in some of our analysis, it's millions of corporates, private equities, 2.6 million for our uh, uh, carbon emission data set. Um, over there, investor engagement, definitely uh, um, important from a stewardship perspective. Sustainable financing, so some of the analysis that we did on mandatory reporting, which is on everyone's minds, uh, because it's going to happen here in New Zealand, probably first anywhere in the world as of 2024. Um, companies are going to be required to do that reporting. Um, what's important about it is some of the research that I've been involved in. Um, one particular paper with IGCC, Investor Group on Climate Change, indicated that companies that are more sustainable have greater access to markets, greater access to capital, sustainable financing, and also more better long-term <laughs> performance. Um, supply chain management. I've been doing this role for more than a decade, and it's now that we're talking about supply chain, supply chain issues, moving beyond issues that are, the, that are just environmental, including social issues like modern slavery. A transition to net zero. I disagree with Larry Fink. I can't believe it. All these years I've said Larry Fink is amazing, and he's done wonderful things, but if he's saying that climate change uh, is going to suck all the oxygen out of every other sustainability initiative or every other investment theme, then uh, you know, I think he's being overly hopeful and wishful. <laughs> the energy that we need to put into climate change is determined by a rapid decarbonisation. We need to act now in order to reduce global carbon emissions by 50%. And the fact is that you, you can't look at E on its own. ES and G don't exist in isolation. I've got a nice slide to show that, so I won't spend too long saying it here. And sustainability reporting. That's definitely the theme here in New Zealand with TCFD aligned climate change reporting. Uh, but all reporting is important uh, from a sustainability perspective, whether it's TCFD or impact reporting, uh, whether it's reporting that's aligned to a standard like ISSB or uh, separate reports. Uh, I mentioned 100 years of S&P Global, but what I really want to demonstrate here is the direct experience that S&P Global has with sustainability. I'm going to point out just a couple of things with, if I can do this without turning everything off, which I just turned everything off, okay? How did you do this so well, Bruce? You got that point of working, you made me very impressed. I'm going to try this button. No? Okay, I'm just going to give up. Um, 2015, S&P Global requires True Cost. True Cost is an organisation that had 20 years experience working in climate change. 20 years experience in climate change is a long time. Right? Climate change hasn't been around on many people's focus, or, or uh, many people's radar for that long. So we bring all of that experience into the ecosystem of S&P Global, and that's the millions of asset level data points that we have. In fact, I was um, looking recently, we added up all the data points we have in ESG, and we have 700 billion ESG data points. That's a lot, right? If you think about that, I'll stop them for a second, because I thought, if you count every data point, if you look at every data point for one second, how many years would that take? Do we have any quick mathematicians? No, you're all doing that Daniel Kahneman system in two moment, you're thinking, oh, can I calculate that? Let me tell you, it is 22,000 years. So, Thank God we've got computers, otherwise it would need more than one lifetime to look at all that data. Um, the other point I want to highlight is uh, our acquisition of the Rubico SAM ESG scores. And that's really important because the way Rubico SAM are looking at ESG scores is completely different to the way anyone else was assessing ESG scores or ratings. I'm going to dig a bit more deeply into that, but I think the way to, to, the way to see it is it's a proactive outreach to companies to 
have them a, a complete an assessment, not on their own, but with our support. So it's not a box ticking exercise at all, which you might say, well, if you give them a survey, they can write anything. No, we're qualifying the information that they're putting into that report. That then leads to all the data that goes into the data sets, which enable ESG integration. These are the slides I'm going to go quickly over. What this tells you is that we're not working on our own. And if you're working in ESG, you're not working on your own. Sustainability is an ecosystem. There are many players involved. S&P Global is partnered and contributes to many of these organisations. This, to me, is a demonstration that ESG, climate risk, climate analysis is here to stay. It's not something, it's not short term. It's not a short term trend. It's an initiative that represents a change in the way we assess companies. Nowadays, we look at companies, and our expectation is that they are good corporate citizens. This is a ground up initiative coming from you as investors and consumers of products. Right? Greater expectations on companies than just making a profit at any expense. Um, I mentioned before that ESG uh, is not, cannot be looked at in isolation. Uh, we need to look at the, the three uh, factors together. Uh, here's an example focused on one issue, uh, climate related, where natural capital might stand out as an E factor, but just transition, it's a social factor. Uh, credible sustainable debt markets, uh, credible disclosure, are factors that take into account governance as well. I'll, I'll point you to the website, have a look at ESG trends that will drive, or trends that will drive the ESG agenda in 2022. This was one of the key um, analysis from that report. Again, uh, the themes of why climate change is important, um, factors that we're seeing from IPCC, we're seeing the impact and linking it back to human uh, carbon emissions, and even the IEA is modelling scenarios now that see uh, solar becoming the new king of electricity. Another way to think about the ecosystem of uh, initiatives uh, that are promoting and supporting frameworks around ESG and climate change are initiatives like TCFD, TNFD, which you're going to hear more about, uh, sustainable goals, NGFS, PCAP, but I've left ISSB for the last one that I'll point out, because this is a relatively new initiative which is going to see standardisation mm -hmm. of reporting. Another way to think about the global trend is to see that this is being driven by multiple stakeholders, not just investors. I've been working with investors for a decade focused on ESG, and now we start to see that countries are setting net zero targets, regulators are setting standards. Don't need to say that more than once because we're, we're sitting in a country where regulators are very heavily involved. But just over the ditch, you might have seen a, um, the ACCC and ASIC both put out papers on greenwashing and guidance on greenwashing. So it's on it's on regulators' minds, and their regulators, um, including the Reserve Bank of Australia, that uh, report on climate risk as being a material risk. Stock exchanges, 25 there globally, 11 of which are in Asia Pacific that mandate reporting. Another way to think about global trends, PRI, TCFD, and science-based targets, initiatives that are being increasingly followed and support greater sustainability. Okay, now's when we get to the part where we think about what integration requires. Because if you're integrating ESG and you're doing it on your own, you're analysing companies, there's, there's benefits to having your own assessments. Uh, but the concerns then are standardisation of approach, resources, and people that you need to, to do the assessment. When I say people that you need to do the assessment, S&P Global has 700 people focused on collecting, maintaining, researching and analysing these data sets. Notice that ESG is the highest pillar because it captures a lot of the themes that are beneath it, including climate change. Climate change is important because of its TCFD focus, uh, which really brought together the way climate change is assessed in the same guys' way. Environmental data sets um, and impact data sets from a positive um, perspective. 
this is a good way to introduce the ESG scores <coughs> that we produce with the, with the um, corporate sustainability assessment it, because it's how they're used rather than tell you first what the scores are let me tell you how you use these scores or other scores in your own analysis and notice that it starts with alpha generation because using ESG, integrating ESG to, and using ESG in your investment process helps you make better informed decisions. Better informed decisions lead to longer term profitability. Uh, risk management, of course, with a focus on the risks from an ESG and climate perspective, portfolio construction, and the various ways to, con to construct portfolios or indices. So S&P Global has a set of indices that we construct, ESG, climate and thematic indices. In fact, we work with and partner with exchanges like the NZX to create carbon efficient indexes that don't just emphasize companies that are climate resilient or have lower carbon intensities, but also weights those companies more highly that report, that disclose their carbon emissions. So we're promoting disclosure through indices, or allowing you as investors to promote disclosure through investing in indices. And then we have the ESG indices, which Canal are, are involved in, uh, that emphasize companies with uh, greater ESG uh, strengths. Let's talk about what some of those ESG strengths are in a second. Of course, engagement, making that direct link back to stewardship codes and, and the important part of integration. Reporting, which is critical, so we know what these um, asset managers uh, and super funds are doing and how they're achieving their goals, and also screening. Screening out might include screening out uh, fossil fuels or themes that you're not willing with your values to invest in. Could be gaming, uh, could be weapons, uh, that could be tobacco. From an ESG score perspective, as I say, I've been working in this industry for 10 years. I've seen multiple ways to assess companies through ESG scores, and I've seen the evolution of that process. When I started this 10 years ago, companies weren't really reporting very much. And so you had to get information where you could. And if you tried to call the company and say, hey, can you tell me about the sustainability efforts? 10 years ago, they were going, well, um, no, there's nobody really here who, who's responsible for that. So you took what reported data they had, and you um, made as, as, as a model as much as you could about what they didn't have. And so you see a lot of the way um, organisations who created ESG scores going through disclosure only um, model the, the gaps. When the C when um, Rebecca Sam looked at this, they said, "Well." Okay, we need to try and get information from these organisations and we need more information than they're disclosing. So let's go to them. Let's go to these organisations with an assessment. I went to these organisations with an assessment 20 years ago and the organisation was like, well, we, we don't understand any of this. And so Rubico built up a team to help companies. Help companies understand that if they didn't have the data today, that was okay. Let's, we'll tell you why you need this data. We'll tell you why we think it's important. And then you spend the next year or two building up the knowledge that you have internally to develop these data sets. And what does that mean? That means that the CSA is helping these companies introduce sustainability into their strategy to make sustainability a core part of their strategy. And so fast forward to where we are today, we're working with over 2,400 companies who participate in the assessment for the CSA. And the feedback they give us is that this helps them resource internally their efforts to drive sustainability in their organisation. Sustainability today is a critical part of an organisation's strategy. We see more and more that sustainability affects an organisation throughout all of its operations and throughout its value chain. The consumers of products, you are concerned about the sustainable practices of the companies that you buy products from. Those companies are concerned about their supply chains. All of this creates a, an ecosystem where companies that have greater sustainability have greater ability to manage their risks and identify opportunities. So, 
We're asking companies around 130 questions, 100 to 130 questions. Behind those questions are 1,000 data points. As we ask those questions, we inform companies about why they're important to, those, uh, to, to investors and why they're important to the companies. We then transparently calculate from the data point scores at the question level, and then from those scores, calculate criteria scores, dimension scores, and ESG scores. You can see the ESG scores for a large number of companies, large and mid-cap companies, if you just go to S&P Global right now. S&P Global, ESG scores. Put in the company name and you'll find their ESG scores. You'll find some information about their criteria scores as well. If you have access to our database, you can see the data points. 60% of the companies who complete our data set, who participate, have allowed us to show all of the data that they've entered. Which means around 30% of the data points we have are not easily found in their sustainability reports. So we're creating a data source that has a unique set of information for you to bring into your process. We use this information in our indices we provide it to our investor clients. We're starting to see some investor clients who are more sophisticated go through the dark levels and create their own views on ESG by using question level scores and aggregating the question level scores in their own ways. They do that because they want to focus on certain issues to engage companies on, and they want to emphasize those issues in their investment plans. So multiple ways to use this data in your assessment. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides which thought was easier to talk through looking at that one slide rather than go through them all. Uh, but this kind of this gives you an idea of what's behind the assessment of the CSA. We're looking at likelihood of uh, impact and magnitude of impact. That's how we're selecting the key issues out of the 130 for any particular company. Um, we're breaking the world down into 61 industries because ESG risks tend to be industry specific. And here's an example of through two, uh, three examples, a mining example. What, really what I want to emphasize here is that the uh, blue color there, which is actually represented the proportion of um, uh, the E, or, or sorry, governance, to a, metal, a mining and minerals company, is equal to social and environmental. All three criteria are equally important. But if you go to pharmaceutical companies, the, the aspects around governance are take up a large proportion of the weighting of the issues when we're assessing them. These weights are shown to you through our platform and can be changed if you wish. Uh, I'm going to jump across to uh, a, a focus on, on climate change. So I'm going to do it quickly because we are over time and I'm, I'm going to finish in two minutes to hand over to Lloyd. Um, why is climate change important? Why is Larry Fink wrong? Larry Fink's wrong because of this. We know we need to reduce carbon emissions by 50%. We know that we have eight years to do it. We're about to release some indices which really emphasize how the later you wait, the worse it gets. Because the later you wait, the more you need to decarbonize your investments. We're at 7% at the moment. If you wait until next year and start investing, you'd have to decrease every year by 8%. If you wait the year after, it would increase 9% and so on. Uh, where are we today if we look at Asia Pacific? How aligned are companies today? by segment, if we group them together by segment, no segment in Asia Pacific is aligned to a 1.5 degree world. How are we going to achieve 50% re emissions reduction with this task at hand? There's a lot of work to do. What's good is that with the company level data, we can assess those companies' alignment to Paris. And that means that you have tools which you can then engage companies on, or divest. But as soon as you divest, you lose the ability to engage. You, know, you can no longer use the powers of stewardship. So there's, there's a lot of discussion around this at the moment, which, which way do we go? And if you can see here, um, pathways to a, a two degree world would see you Paris aligned, and this is looking at the energy sector, you can see this on our website as well, and the S&P Global 1,200, the largest companies in the world are well above that, greater than three degree world. And, and we can do this at the company level too, so we can see company trajectory, which is the um, orange, yellow line, I don't know if I'm color blind, but, and the two lines which go, um, with that are a, a two degree trajectory and a well below two degree trajectory. This level of information, the carbon emissions, um, the Paris alignment, carbon earnings at risk, is what is used for our reporting and disclosure. This reporting and disclosure can be at a company level, but it could also be at a fund level. We aggregate it up 
We've got tools that you can do it yourself on a platform, Capital IQ Pro, or we can do this uh, reporting for you as an, as an investor. We're giving, I'm, I'm giving you these options and talking about reporting directly to you because this is required. This is what's going to be needed. And this baseline assessment, measuring alignment, analyzing scenarios, setting targets, science-based targets. S&P Global has a science-based target. To, our target is to net zero by 2040. We're going to reduce emissions by 25% by 2025. And the bit which is interesting is we're going to bring our suppliers along with us. By 2025, we've committed to have 80% of our supply chain have a science-based target as well. Uh, reporting on progress, financing the ambition. All the bankers in this room should be very excited about what's happening at the moment, but what's going to happen with the financing opportunities is companies that uh, identify with great sustainability will be looking for green bonds, social bonds, um, sustainability bonds, and who knows, maybe biodiversity bonds in the near future. Let's hope that we can get to a stage where we're actually protecting nature as well as companies. I'm going to stop there. Thank you all very much for your attention, and I look forward to speaking to you at drinks afterwards. I'm Lloyd Kavanagh. I'm a partner here at Mintrails and Rudwatts and our financial services team. I'm also a member of the Board of Lawyers for Climate Action New Zealand. Um, as a couple of you reminded me when we were out having drinks, uh, if you have a law degree, even if you've never used it, you're eligible to join. So, you know, maybe relevant to what's happening here. Um, where's the button? There we go. Okay, so if you remember anything out of what I'm going to say to you in the next 15 minutes. Here it is. I'll say it again at the end. We should be done. The label has to match what's inside the tin. Okay, keep that in your mind. So we've heard a lot of good things here today about ESG, and that's really encouraging. Um, and I've put up on my slide here some of the things that we're hearing people talking about. And I think that's really encouraging, and ESG is vitally important. However, I've got a challenge to all of us New Zealanders. Are we the greenwashing nation? 100% pure, but don't swim in the river, you get sick. Remember that. Now, greenwashing, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, is not just about the environment. It's about making claims, particularly ESG claims, by labels that don't match what's in the tin. So keep that in your mind. I'll throw another uh, quote or slogan. Uh, this one's five years old. Climate change is the nuclear-free moment of our generation. I nearly forgot that one. It's still important. So we are more positively doing a lot of these really good things, although actually, whether or not uh, we've had the f world first climate reporting legislation could be contested by some folks in Europe and small countries there, but we won't go into that. Um, so we are doing important things. However, we need to make sure that that label matches what's in the tin. Now, fortunately, our good friends, starting with the FMA, and I see we've got a large crew of them here today, so raise your hands, FMA, we appreciate your efforts. Um, uh, a few years ago, 2020, put out a disclosure framework for integrated financial products, uh, which basically means financial products that claim to do something else in addition to giving you a return. Um, they tell me that they have been conducting a focused thematic on some of the products that are offered uh, and that they're going to report on it real soon, so that's fantastic to, to hear because it's going to help. They are also conducting investor focus groups to understand what people are doing. Our other friends at the Commerce Commission, and I don't think we have any of those here today, or if they do, 
big shout for the Commerce Commission, are telling traders that the claims they make should be borne out um, by what they actually do. The NZX has guidance note, and the ASA has uh, an advertising code, which is all really good stuff. Uh, but we have to be honest, our neighbours across the ditch are actually being way more active. And I've put a sample of cases, particularly the ACCC, which is their Commerce Commission, is really having a crack at people claiming that they're, what they're doing is particularly environmentally friendly. Um, and I have to say, I think although the federal government in Australia has only recently realised that climate change is a thing, um, with the change of government there, some of their agencies and a lot of their investing community are well ahead of us. So we shouldn't uh, be too uh, complacent. Now, I look at you lot, and you look a very handsome, intelligent, smart audience, so I reckon you're going to get this right, unlike most New Zealanders in a poll which was taken, uh, I guess, about three months ago. Now, here's the question. In relation to commitments that uh, have been made by governments around the world, which climate change track are we currently on? So these are if commitments that have currently been given are performed. Are we, who uh, thinks 1.5 degrees or less? I've got none of those, okay. Uh, who thinks around about two degrees? Yep, good to see that called out. Who thinks uh, 3.2 degrees? 3.2 degrees is the correct answer, folks. So, I think we need to have a call to uh, just be aware of what's actually going on in our world. So, as well as the regulators, there are litigators, activists, who are taking action in relation to those folks who are putting one thing on the label. And I'm going to explain what happens, because it's not mostly not badly intended on the label, but there's something else in the tin. So um, there's basically four broad categories of things that are going on. Number one is non-disclosure, so not telling people anything at all about the risks that they are um, exposed to. And there's a case over here in Australia running called O'Donnell, and Ms. O'Donnell, who's an ecology student, is basically suing the Commonwealth because it's in Australia, government bond issues have to play by the same rules as corporates. In New Zealand, they don't. We have an exemption for the Crown, so that's lucky. Um, but she's saying, hey, read the prospectus for your sovereign bond issue, no mention in there as to how climate change might impact on Australia and, their, and the risk, therefore, that's inherent in these bonds. Uh, still underway. Um, greenwashing, which is the main thing that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, uh, let's see, where's a good example? Well, the only New Zealand uh, case, if you can call it that, Alkanzi went to the Advertising Standards Board in relation to first gas who were claiming that their natural gas was uh, better gas, or implying that it was better gas, and the Advertising Standards Board said, well, you were overheating the pudding a little bit. Um, Non-adaptation is the thing that I think we're going to see coming. Um, and an example which was settled in Australia uh, is, was Mc, McVeigh versus REST. REST stands for uh, retail Employees Superannuation Trust, so it was a super scheme. Mr McVeigh was a young guy, I think a law student in this case, who had a part-time job in a store. He was doing in terms of adaptation, so he wrote to them and they ignored him, and he wrote to them a few times, uh, and then he decided, well, hell, I should sue them, because that's what boys do. Uh, uh, and then he got further discovery. The reason they weren't answering his questions is they hadn't thought in a 30-year time horizon as to what was happening in his scheme. So they were not adapting their investment portfolio for these risks. Uh, the case was settled, and um, I understand that they've now woken up and changed their minds. 
So there are lots of things going on here. Now, for those of you who are fund managers or product issuers, that there are two broad frameworks, and I'm not going to get into which legislation it's under, uh, particularly because um, actually this is partly adapted from things we got from our Australian colleagues across the ditch and, and uh, augmented. But the first thing is misleading or deceptive conduct in the marketing of a product. Uh, that's you know, particularly that label not reflecting what's in the tin. Um, and that can get you, as a good friend from the FMA will tell you, in a whole world of pain. On the other side, once people have already invested, these are the things like Mr. McVeigh, um, thinking about, well, and again, uh, Bruce, picking up your comment about fiduciary duties, your duty of care, do you care for me as the investor? Are fund managers changing, in particular, but also other issuers, changing what they're doing to take account of the money that they've already got and making sure that it's deployed in a way which addresses their duties of care and diligence. And those are going to be the two board heads that you see the focus coming over time. Um, by the way, I didn't give you the answer to what most New Zealanders think the answer is to that pop quiz. Uh, the answer was sort of evenly split between 2 degrees and uh, 1.5. So most of our colleagues are wrong, most of our countrymen. So I'm just going to jump through a little bit about how these risks arise in practice. And it's not because, for the most part, people are con men and women, uh, that they are malicious or deceptive. The biggest one is arising because of targets. So you get well-meaning folks who say something like net zero by 2030. How cool is that? Let's all commit to that. And then uh, that is the genuine belief and aspiration at the top of the organisation. And somewhere down in the middle, people don't change what they're doing. They're still doing the same stuff they've been doing for 20 years. Uh, and so there is no plan or an insufficient plan. They haven't reviewed it, they haven't done due diligence, they haven't worked out how that top level policy is going to translate into action. And for fund managers, that involves often a chain that they have to follow through, because it might not be their organisation, but they invest in another fund uh, or in an index, and there are questions all the way down that that trail. The next is truth to label where people are, and it's quite related, but it's particularly people are wanting to make a claim and you will have seen, um, you will have seen back in one of the earlier slides a picture of a bus stop in the UK with HSBC's name on it, um, where they had made some uh, well-intentioned comments that they were specifically trying to comply with. But underlying that, there was an implicit uh, claim to action which wasn't able at that time to be addressed. And so the British Advertising Standards um, Authority had a crack at them successfully. Now, enterprise branding, we haven't seen much here of here, but these are people who name very, the name of the company itself or the enterprise is implicitly making a claim about what they do. So I guess that would be us at Lawyers for Climate Action New Zealand <laughs> if we didn't take any action. So we're trying hard to take some. Uh, and then the disclosure, and this does link to the topic that I'm next going to talk a little bit about, but very briefly, which is New Zealand's coming climate. Um, uh, climate uh, disclosure regime. Um, and this gets bogged right down in the details of what people say in annual reports, what they put in their disclosure, and again the question as to how much due diligence they've actually done to make sure that what they put on the label reflected what was in the tin. And we are seeing around the world a lot of action in relation to all of these. Uh, people are slowly 
improving their processes. And I guess this is the positive call to action. When someone tells you that they're doing something great on ESG, I believe the response which should be, that's fantastic. Tell me a little bit more about how you know that that's what's happening and how does it manifest itself on a day-to-day basis. So, um, there are a lot of, in this reporting area in particular, a lot of developments going on. In New Zealand, we now have Part 7A of the Financial Markets Conduct Act, uh, which will come into force uh, around the start of next year. Our friends at the XRB, the uh, External Reporting Board, are busy drafting disclosure um, standards, which will be the basis on which some companies will report. Um, and they are due to put out a uh, consultation, official consultation draft on the 28th of July. There's going to be almost no time for the first for companies with calendar financial years to get ready because it's going to start to bite on 1 January for them, although they won't have to report for a year and a couple of months afterwards. Um, then, as our friends from uh, s and were pointing out, there are international standards coming also, but New Zealand is an early mover in this area. And of course, <coughs> there's this um, uh, categorization or key pillars in the TCFD, so the Task Force on Climate Disclosure, um, where the first thing to do, and then you can report on it, is what changes you've made to your governance. So again, Bruce, it, it links in with what you were talking about, um, but your views on what's going to happen should impact your strategy, you've got risk management issues to address, and then of course what manifests itself in the reporting are the metrics and targets. So now I'm going to swap a little bit uh, and spend just a few moments more on what we understand is happening on the climate related disclosures timeline, sort of recap something that you may or may not be aware of is it will bite for what are called large listed issuers, so that basically means entities that have equity or debt listed on the NZX, but not elsewhere, uh, with the market cap of 60 mil, which is actually not that big. Um, and then large financial institutions, which are banks with over a billion dollars worth of assets, Fund managers who manage a regulated fund or funds are schemes that have over a billion dollars worth of assets and uh, licensed insurers who have a um, billion dollars in assets or 250 mil annual uh, premium income. And so we're on this little timeline I alluded to before which is incredibly tight, the XRB issuing the statements the FMA then are being the policeman and enforcing those and then we're going to get somewhere out here because uh, we put April because in New Zealand most companies are 1 April to 31 March financial year entities um, so it'll be after April that those who started their financial year earlier are going to be putting out statements where it links back to what I was talking about before is of course people want to do the right thing and they know they're going to have to report about it so you're getting lots of folks signing up for initiatives because they're saying hey in about 15 to 18 months we're going to have to tell people what we've been doing wouldn't be great if we said we're going to be net zero by 2030 or something like that so um, lucrative times for people who want to find uh, opportunities to catch folks out who haven't done it properly um, I'm being a little facetious with that. Actually, we want people to make the adjustment, but sometimes you need just a bit of a nudge to get people into taking it seriously. So what should all these guys be doing? And this, I've tried to really distill down some basic principles that apply, not just to greenwashing, but frankly, good corporate governance mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and things that issuers should be doing. And I'm not going to 
kind of run you through them all because a lot of them are, as the American friends say, mom and apple pie statements. Uh, but it's really a job of work to make sure that the aspirations which organisations really well intentioned, well intentioned uh, uh, wanting to do actually get translated for the reasons I've explained and what emerges for those of you who are investors when you've made a choice that you want to have an ESG oriented uh, investment uh, actually when you open the top of that tin finding inside uh, something that matches the label <coughs> So again, I think that's the key point that I want to make for today. Thank you.